And I love that because the comforter sent from God to us is his Holy Spirit. And in this very spirit of Christ, it's who we know is in the person of Jesus when we study him in Scripture. The wonderful promise from Isaiah that we sing and celebrate at this time of year, that we will have a wonderful counselor come for you and for me. And not just a counselor as in, a, oh, we just take our problems to him all the time and that's it. No, a one that's an advisor. He's giving us wisdom on not just, you know, what to do in the bad times, but how to make the, make the better times better and how to guide us and direct us in every day and everything we face. And so that's what we celebrate as we look at Nehemiah. And in fact, next, next chapter, we get to a really celebratory. So come back next Sunday and we'll celebrate Christmas all over again. Next chapter is really celebratory. It's really neat as they dedicate the wall and they, they celebrate the work that God has done. But today we're going to talk about exposing religious deception. Now there was a pastor, I heard this was actually a true story, a pastor that had gone and was a guest speaker at a church and as he showed up, the pastor there at the church just with a really forlorn look meeting the guest speaker said, I don't know if you know what you got yourself into but this is one of the toughest congregations you can preach at in America and uh, and the congregation um, it was just, just really hard on this pastor. And the, the guest speaker said, well, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll do my best. I don't know what the, he kind of taken back by what he saw. And he, he went and he start, started to preach. And, and he, every little bit, he would hear little cynical jeers thrown at him. Well, what does this guy know? Somebody would say something over here. And the, somebody over on the other side would say, where did he get his degree? And they would, he would hear these things, these strange, you know, outlandish thoughts. And he was actually talking about the lake of fire. He had a really passionate, really, you know, important message that he was giving and and he was hearing these things all over the place and finally he stopped and said folks I don't know if you get this but this is an important study for you I'm trying to warn you as best as I can and this scripture that I'm going to share with you tells you that that if you don't heed what I say there's a place for you that has weeping and gnashing of teeth and one of the ladies up in the balcony looked down and saw him and said you know what sir you're a liar because people like me, even if I go, ain't got no teeth. <laughs> and he stopped for a moment and he looked at her and he said, if you believe it, I've got a word for you from the Lord. Teeth for you, ma'am, will be provided. <laughs> I think in these situations and in, in, in these studies, that we, I don't want to become cynical I don't want us to, when we talk about deception in the church or in the world or the things in you and I live in, even though we see it everywhere, I don't want us to become in such a way that we, we don't trust anyone or we, we automatically shut everyone down and we become very negative. And, and it's easy to get that way, isn't it, when we think about just all the ways that we could be taken advantage of in this life. So I don't want us to become cynical like that congregation. I, I want us to be uh, people that are wise, as, as though we, you know, we, we eat the fish but spit out the bones kind of thing. We, you know, when, when we come to the, the, as Jesus said last week, and we remembered in, in the scripture from Matthew, is that we would be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. Not just wise, but we would be very uh, innocent. We'd be very caring. We'd be very, very a, a peace-filled um, vessel as we we go and we experience and we understand the things that are around us that even are deceptive and I want to talk about religious deception today as we continue in our study you can turn to Nehemiah Nehemiah chapter 6 last week we talked about some things that you might remember if you were here if not um, we'll cover just just briefly here uh, remember, we talked in Revelation twelve nine. Satan is the deceiver of the world, and I reminded you: if you think that, that you know you're cool and, and great, and, and nothing's you know going to deceive you, Satan's not going to try you and test you. Think again, because he is the deceiver of the whole world. He's out for everybody and trying to use his minions and use his demons to try to, to get into your mind and thoughts. And you and I know that there are just ways that it's easy and it seems like everywhere we turn to, to get deceived in some strange ways or another. And we see that in Matthew 24 in those verses. And we'll look at some of that here today. But Jesus warned in the end times that there's going to be great deceptions all over the place in the earth. And so we would want to challenge ourselves to be prepared, not that we're going to go through some of the greatest deception of all time in the tribulation. Thank goodness we're going to be spared of that. 
But even so, and even now, as we're looking at the world around us, it's just amazing how things are just amped up. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we see that this is a very expressed thing, the Spirit says, that in the end, there are going to be people that are going to be deceived, even so much so that they might even depart from the truth that they know. And we don't want to be part of that. And so last week we talked about dispelling individual deceptions, the way Satan comes at you and me individually on a daily basis. Because we talked about how Nehemiah was getting, uh, trying to get sucked in in a very cordial uh, lunch meeting with uh, these three guys, right? Sam Blatt, Tobiah, and Geshem. He was just, oh, come on, man, just have lunch with us. You're working hard. And that was to Nehemiah's demise. And Nehemiah did some things that we looked at in disposing or exposing deception, rather, and making sure that we don't fall for tricks of the enemy. We talked about last week, sticking with what we're called to do today, right? What God has told you to do. And, and that, that means there's obedience there. That means that we have to be asking the Lord, what do you want me to do today? How, how, how would you lead me by your spirit? What am I called to do? Where, am, am I working in the ways that God has called me to? We operate outside of those things and we, we, I guess, expose ourselves to potential deceptions and places and things. We start looking at other people and wishing we were that. or we start to, And Satan just has a foothold all of a sudden if we don't stick to who God has made us and what he's called us to do on a daily basis. We saw how he, uh, Nehemiah was quick to say no. Uh, you know what? No, I'm not going to spend time with you for lunch or doing this thing, this thing coming down to meet you guys because, uh, you know, I'm busy. Why would I stop the work that God has put in front of me? He was able to say no. And boy, we talked about that, how we need to be people that learn to say no. Even as parents, that's tough. Boy, that's tough. And we've got to ask questions. And he asked questions of, of these guys. And, and in pray, not just asking questions of other people. When you think somebody's trying to get you, don't just ask them questions, but ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do in this situation? Uh, one thing I've learned in this study more than anything in Nehemiah is I love his ability to at every moment and at every turn and every big decision, take a moment and pray. And it doesn't even have to be a big prayer. It doesn't have to be any super spiritual, you know, if I say this right, I'll get my answer. And if not, boy, I don't know. It's just a simple prayer. Lord, guide me and direct me in this. Don't let me fall in this. I, I, I love that. And, and we see that his answer, asking questions also came with prayer. And, and, and Nehemiah wasn't deceived. Now get this, when Satan tries, he's going to try again. <laughs> Just when you think you got one battle won, get ready for battle number two and three and four. Get this. This is crazy. This is just crazy and bizarre how this story turns. Let's look at it. Following, I believe it's in verse 10 of chapter 6. And afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah. Uh, the son of Amenabal, who was a secret informer. And he said to me, let us to meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. In verse 11, I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I would go uh, to go, or who is there such as I to go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Verse 12 says, then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he had pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason, he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way in sin so that they might have cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. Verse 14 says, My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat according to these their works and the prophets and uh, Neodiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. What in the world is just how, isn't this crazy? You, you got this first setup of, of deceptions and trying to send letters and send letters and, and Nehemiah just keeps saying, no, I'm not going to come meet you guys. And then he sends a guy with an open letter, meaning that it was spoken to everybody, that you're all trying to rebel. This was last week. You're all trying to rebel. Nehemiah's trying to set up his own kingship and he's trying, you're trying to rebel against the king. Come on. We, and he's trying to pull lure, trying to pull Nehemiah into his, his little game. Nehemiah didn't fall for it. And then here he's like, okay, well, you know what? The only way I think I can get to Nehemiah now is by trying to deceive him religiously. 
trying to deceive him in some of the ways that are closest, nearest, and dearest to his heart. Trying to use things like the temple, like the church. Trying to use things like people that seem to be trusted and trying to lure them into something that would not be good. I think, uh, interesting, the turn when, when, when Peter was talking to Jesus, at one point Jesus is telling him that he's going to build this church on this confession that Peter made, that, that he was the Lord. And then in the same token, not very much time later, in fact, it could have been even in the same uh, conversation, Jesus looks at Satan, when, or say, well, literally Satan, but, but Peter rather, and when Peter says, no, Jesus, you're not going to die, we're not going to let you die. And, and remember, Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, you're not thinking of the things of God, but the things of men. Isn't that strange and interesting that Satan wants to even take those people even nearest and dearest, those things that seem so close to us, and, and even use them in a way to deceive us? It's kind of scary. But I want to give you some hope today because Nehemiah gives us some very practical information on how to dispel these deceptions that even happen in the religious world. So let's look at some of these today as we go through this, kind of look at these first four verses. Number one, I want you to put this down if you can. In your notes, religious deception will claim secrets. Now, note, I have five, not four. I'm not trying to deceive you or anything. I noticed in your notes I'd put the four reasons. Well, I got five, so sorry about that, but I wanted to make sure I made that point so you didn't think I was trying to pull one on you. Number one, religious deception will claim secrets. If you look back there in verse 10, that this was a household coming from the one metabol that was a secret informer. And this was a family that, that was known as the, the secretive people. They, they were the ones that kind of informed on people. They were the ones that kind of had the secrets that people were looking for. And they were kind of those kind of people. And, and, and I think it's interesting. Nehemiah looks at this and, and, and he just knows that something's kind of up because of who is giving the testimony, who is giving the passing the word along. And even so for you and I, I want you to see that religious deception nowadays often comes with people that claim secrets. Matthew 24, Jesus says this about those in the end times that are going to claim this very thing. He says, then if anyone says to you, look here is the Christ or there, don't believe it. For false Christ, false prophets, they will rise and show you great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you. Beforehand, now therefore, if, you, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. For uh, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Wow, interesting. Jesus is saying there in the days that you and I really are living in right now, don't believe these people that are saying, look, we found the secret. We found him. Did you know that there is a self-proclaimed antichrist right now? I can't remember his name, but I saw a report on him down in Florida. Uh, he's got, you know, some, you know, couple million followers worldwide. It's very interesting. Um, you can look at it. Uh, I can't think of his name right now off the top of my head. But anyway, he, he's self-proclaimed. Uh, people are just, you know, falling before him, claiming that he is a man of great power and wisdom. And, and he's claiming that he is Jesus incarnate. And it's kind of interesting. He says uh, he's making claims that really aren't even biblical at all close. But, but it's interesting as he's driving people and pulling people his way even nowadays that he didn't come with lightning flashes from the east. And we talked about the east gate a few you know, studies ago. He didn't ride through Jerusalem on, 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 a, on a horse through the east gate. He, he's not matching at all any biblical type of anything, but he claims secrets. He's got the secret. He knows what he's doing. Um. I think it's interesting, but, but even so, not even in an antichrist sense, I think of the, 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 some of the television stations and the TV preachers, and I'm not going to name names, but you know, one of them rhymes with, you know, boasting and, um, maybe that's kind of what he does, but I don't know. Anyway, I, I, 
there are just they, they claim that they have ideas and things that are going to prosper you and make you feel good and things that are going to be great and wonderful. And it's easy to think, I need secrets because I'm missing something in life. You know, I've been given the story, I've been given the same old thing, and it's just not doing it for me. So I need something new. Be careful. And this guy, he comes in and, and, and he claims to Nehemiah, you know what, I want to I, I wanna let you know, I got a secret, I got a hot tip. Somebody's out for you and, and you need to quickly come, come, meet with me. We're going to go to the safe place, the church. Get this, folks. We're trying our best to make this a safe place here at Calvary Bible, but not every church is a safe place. Don't think that you can just run anywhere and expect it's going to be a safe thing. Now, interestingly enough, and we'll talk here in a little bit, that that Nehemiah sees through this because he knows Scripture. But but understand this, is that, that, that you get to a discontented place in life or you need something more, and be careful where you run. Because this guy's saying, come into the temple, follow me, I've got it, I've got this out to tip. And, and Nehemiah's like, I'm not, I'm not impressed with secrets. Tell me the old, old story. Fun seeing things, right? Tell me, I, I want to know the truth that, that has stood the test of time, not a new thing that's going to make me feel better about myself or direct my life in such a way that, that, that I'll be better off. Or, that, that's not the case. Stick to the script. Religious deception will claim secrets. And you'll run into people I have that will say, this is, this is it, man. You gotta believe this. And it won't have anything to do with salvation. It won't have anything to do with the cross. It'll be just another idea, another thing. And a lot of those are passing fads. Folks, don't follow it. Please don't follow it. If it's not rooted in Christ and him crucified, as Paul said, that's all I wanna know to the Corinthians. That's all I wanted to know coming to you is Christ and him crucified. That's it. If there's no foundation to Christ, don't believe it. Don't believe it. It's just a secret. Next thing I want you to see is religious deception will pressure or belittle you, and that equals bad fruit. I, I see this here as he's coming and he's talking to, to, to Nehemiah. He's saying this, this, this informant. He's saying, you know what? You got to do this and you got to do it quick. You got to do it quick. It's time. You got to do it quick. The pressure's on, man. Somebody's coming for you. And it's your life. Religious deception often will pressure you or belittle you. I've been in situations where I've run into people in the church that, that not only did they have a secret, they, they gave a time frame with it. Have you ever been there? You ever heard that? Boy, if you give $1,999 in the next five minutes, you'll be blessed. Wait for minute number six. You'll only be half as blessed. You can still send it. Um, There are people in the church, and that's one re- among many. Again, I've run into people in the church that have come my way, and, and, and everything felt like pressure. Pray this prayer now. Say this this way. Do it that way. Why? Well, because God showed me it this way. Well, he hasn't showed me that. <laughs> And you'll get pressured, or they'll belittle you, and, and they'll, they'll say, you know, well, I, they'll say, well, how long, they'll ask you questions, how long have you been in ministry, how long have you been born again, or, you know, I've been, you know, my goodness, I've been around the block for a long time, so you should listen to me, right, they'll belittle you. There'll be people that'll come by, and they'll, they'll say, well, well who, who do you listen, who do you follow? Oh, well, well, I know, and you don't. That's what they'll say, and they'll be like that. So be careful because this is not good fruit at all. Matthew 7 reminds us of this. Jesus is talking to his disciples saying, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Now do men gather grapes from thorn, uh, thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit good tree can't bear good fruit, nor can a bad tree bear bad or good fruit, rather. Every tree, verse 19, that says, or every tree that does not, not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Think of another guy that I had heard of a long time ago. He's still in ministry. It's interesting. 
And I'm not going to say names today because I don't think that's, this is the time or the place to get negative on a lot of things like that. But I do know that there are people out there, and one guy in particular was found out in a lot of ways he was cheating and stealing with money. And he was, you know, doing a whole bunch of things. CBS did a special on him, an hour-long thing. It might even expose who it is. But it's interesting how, you know what, even the world, I mean, if you're not living above reproach as a teacher, the world's going to come and find you. And, and, and you know what, the same thing goes for me and for you. If we're going to try to be, you know, stewards of the Lord's work and, and ambassadors for him, don't think that, you know, as Galatians 6, 8 says it. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that'll reap. He'll come back and get you. And I think of some false prophets, this one in particular, that the world has even come after him because of the way he's handled money and the things that he's done. And, and, and it's exposed, it's laid bare. You can find it on YouTube. You can find all the information about this person. And yet people don't, I mean, they, they're just ignorantly blinded by it, by this person's secrets and the things that he does and the amazing ways that he woos people. It's just hard. And a lot of times it's just these people that pressure and be little people and they just still feel like they've got to follow and, uh, and Jesus says, no, 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 that's not good fruit. Good fruit's not about people tearing other people down. Good fruit's not about pressuring people into anything. Good fruit would direct people towards the Savior. The direct people towards the leading of the God's Spirit would direct not towards themselves. So be careful when people try to pressure or belittle you and know that, that no matter what they say, the religious talk that comes out of their mouth is just jabberwocky. It's nothing. I mean, because the Lord, I love this. John six sixty three says, Jesus says, my words are spirit and life. So when you know it's coming from the throne room, because these people might say, oh, I've got a word from the Lord. Or they might say, well, I, I, you know, the Lord told me to tell you this. Well, be careful. Does it give life? Then maybe it is of the Lord. It, 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 does it not profit anything? It's of the flesh. Be careful with that. So I, I love that. And the great thing is, is that even when somebody, even, even when somebody gives you a negative, you know, something that's, you know, confronts you in sin or, you know, just even, even if it's something that to the world would look negative, to us in Christ, it'll be life. It really will. So don't think that just because somebody comes with you, comes to you and, and, and not belittles you, but, but says something, you know, maybe not so kind, has a harder word for you. Don't think, that, oh, don't dispel. Again, don't, don't, be careful. I think Jesus gave very good wisdom uh, to people, to, to, I think it's the Ephesian church, and he said, you know, test those things. Might have been the Thessalonian church. Test, test what you hear. Hold on to what is good. So don't just, if somebody has something and, and, and it seems like, why did he say that? That seemed kind of mean or harsh. Don't, don't just push those away because sometimes that's going to be life for you because he's going to be keeping you from the errors of your ways. But just be very careful knowing that what the Spirit's going to speak through other people or the ways that he's going to use people that really come from him is going to be life-giving and it's not going to be destructive. So be careful with that. Religious deception will pressure and belittle you. Don't fall for that. And the third thing, religious deception will intentionally neglect the whole truth. This is where things get interesting. Nehemiah says in verse 11, of chapter 6, and I said, should such a man as I flee, and who is there such as I that would go into the temple to save his life? I won't go in. And what Nehemiah say, I'm not going to fall for this. Do you know, do you, do you know truth? Do you know scripture? Nehemiah did. Second Chronicles 23, 6 says this, but let no one come into the house of the Lord except the priest and those uh, who the Levites, uh, of the Levites who serve. They may go in for they are holy, but the people shall be kept or shall keep watch of the Lord. And in this situation, in this time, the, the call was to not go in for anybody other than the priest to go into the temple. Not that this was common, because you could go in, you could go into different courts of the temple and you could do your sacrifices and you could admire and worship the Lord. But, but, but what's being said there in 2 Chronicles 23 is that, okay, at this time, at this point, that point, you don't, you don't do that. You go to the Lord with reverence, you don't, and just any old person can't just bust in to save their life in the temple. And it's interesting, 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 23, you might remember King Uzziah. 
King Uzziah tried to go offer incense by himself in the temple because he thought he was, you know, I'm king, I can go do whatever I want. He did it. What happened? Leprosy. Boom. The priest even warned him, don't do it. He did it anyway. And it's interesting because religious deception, people that come at you and try to lure you into something, they, they, they don't want you to go check it out in Scripture and be a Berean and check it out for yourself. They're, believe me now or don't. That's not faith if you don't believe me, they'll say. They'll neglect the rest of the truth. I see a, a Christianity that's starting to rise up, and you may hear of it. You may hear of it even from popular musicians and things in the Christian church. That really, you know, they, they look at sin and they say, well, you know what, it's forgiven anyway. And it's kind of this sloppy kind of lifestyle that people have in the church anymore. And, and, and I find it dangerous in that they look at certain scriptures, like if we confess our sins, he'll be faithful in just First John 1, 9. And what a promise, and I believe that promise, is as I go to the Lord with a, a heart of repentance and confessing my sin, he's going to forgive me. But they look at that and they just interpret it in their way and saying, you know what, that means that pff, it's all forgiven. Everything's forgiven. They just take, the, 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 they take the, that end of it. That he'll be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. They go back and, and they look at when Jesus is talking about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Said, every sin's going to be forgiven of men except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And they'd say, oh, every sin's going to be forgiven. Let's party. And little do they know that they're teetering on blaspheming the Holy Spirit's work in their own life, trying to convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment. So be careful when you follow people nowadays and they say, oh, it's this way. And it should have been this way, but, but the old way is not the right way. And the old things they used to say, but now we've got it. Be careful. Don't neglect the whole truth. Study it out. Seek it out in Scripture. Look to see if it really is there. I, I just I, I sense this, this strange thing here with Nehemiah. Is just you have this guy that's trying to lure him into something that just it seems so good and it seems true and it's kind of true. I think uh, in your bulletin you can see a, a, just a small quote that that Spurgeon had given on deception. It's just discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong, but it's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Because that's what it is, man. Because some of this stuff can look and smell and kind of seem really good. We're not looking for just right and wrong. Satan didn't, that didn't work last week with Nehemiah. Now it's right and almost right. So you got to be careful. I'm glad you come to the house of the Lord to seek refuge. And that's where it needs to be. But probably primarily and not just a building or a person, this is where your refuge needs to be. In the word of the Lord, impersonated, literally John 1, by Jesus himself, led by the spirit of truth who will guide you and lead you into all truth in the times and moments you need it. Seek him, not persons or buildings. Just like Nehemiah said here, I'm not going to go save my life in a building. I've got a savior that's all around me that can take care of me. He feared the Lord. He really did. And I want you to see this. Religious deception often has a money trail. Oh, gee. Ain't that the truth? Look at Jeremiah 5. This is what happened. Because remember, in this passage in Nehemiah 6, they said, the reason why this happened, Nehemiah said, I exposed, I found out. The reason why this all happened was because Sam Blatt and Tobiah, they were paying this guy. It's all about money. Jeremiah 5 says it this way, 26 through 31. For my people, or among my people, are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who, see, uh, who, who sets snares. They set a trap. They catch men as a cage full of birds. So their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and grown rich. Interesting. The Lord even lets some of these people get wealthy. That's because it's not about wealth. <laughs> right? Ecclesiastes told us this morning. 
They've grown, uh, or uh, they've, they've um, become great and grown rich. They've grown fat and sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fearless. They, uh, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy, they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so but what will you do in the end later on jeremiah says about the prophets they just say peace peace and there's no peace there are places and factions in the christian church in the united states talking about a financial recovery because the lord is blessing us tremendously because we're such a christian nation and and you know and he oh mm. This nation's going downhill when we start turning our back on Israel because that's a promise out of the word in Genesis. Things aren't right when we're borrowing crazy fast, more so than we're dealing with money like we should. We talked about a few weeks ago. Seems like every principle we're living by is anti-biblical. Priests and prophets and people in the church are saying, peace, peace, it's good. Stock market's up. My car's still running great. You know, man, know the truth and know that these people generally have a little thing at the end where they're trying to get something out of you and it has a money trail a lot of times. And don't fall for that. Not that you're not supposed to support ministry. I think it's great. And in fact, just kind of a side note, I would say that it's important to, to support ministry that provide solid biblical resources and year-end giving and stuff. I know it's kind of a crazy thing you hear on the radio. It's like, oh my goodness, they just want that's all they want. You know, be, be supporting people that are really bringing out the truth. Do. We need more of that to overtake the, the negative and the bad that's not. But don't fall for it when it's about money. And that's all it is. I think of Philippians 1.17. Paul says there are people that are preaching Christ out of envy and selfish ambition. There are going to be people that are going to do that. Be careful. Acts 5, 1 through 11, Ananias and Sapphira, they were trying to deceive because of wealth. They wanted to look spiritually great, but it had everything to do with their hearts, not their pocketbooks, and that's what took them down. What's going to happen in the end, as it says in Jeremiah 5? In the end, it's not about money. It's about your heart. So religious deception often has a money trail, so be careful and mindful of that. Religious deception, for, finally, 5, fears man more than God. Verse 13 and 14. Nehemiah said, For this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in the way of sin, so that they might have a cause for an evil report, that they might reproach me. My God, remember Tobiah and Samblad according to these their works. And, and, and he, he's, just, he's saying that they wanted me to fear them. Is really the, Nehemiah said, they wanted me to fear them and they wanted me to fall to, to being afraid of them and what they might be able to do to me. But Nehemiah has a holy, wonderful, righteous fear of the Lord. And, and, and I think of this, and this is probably the most important thing in the days that we live in with deception, is that Jesus gave a very clear, uh, very clear litmus test for exposing deception through, through John in 1 John 4. He said, Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is of God, or, or has come in the flesh and is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Now, I, in following, in knowing who to follow, in trusting who, this is, John's saying it's very easy and it's very clear. Do they, do they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they depend on him? He's come in the flesh. He's, he, is, he is God. There's a lot of people in church that don't believe that, the, that, that Jesus is God. They, the hypostatic union doesn't make sense to them and they, they try to, put it together and think, well, God, Jesus couldn't have been full of God. He's son. They get all confused and trying to figure it out and understand it all. But they would, they would be lending themselves to the spirit of Antichrist. Don't be that way. Be careful. So religious deception fears man more than God. And, and you and I can. We can fully fear the Lord. And it says right there, test the spirits whether they're of God. Make sure that everything that comes into your life and in mind is of God. 
It's that simple. And, and I think it needs to be everything that comes into your life. Do you really, and I'm serious, are you making your financial decisions based on whether this is in the fear of the Lord or fear of man? Are you making your prayer, are you pray, is your prayer life in the fear of the Lord or the fear of man? Not just your purchases, your, 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 where you live, the, the things that you do on a daily, daily basis, your, your job environment, where you work, the things you, is this because I fear man, because they're trying to tell me to do this, or is it because I fear the Lord? You see, if we live in the fear of the Lord, we can even be thrown in a fiery furnace like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we'll be fine. We'll be fine. But if we fear man, we're going to bow down to people and places and do things we wish we would not have. So I would challenge you. Religious deception wants you to fear man, but I would challenge you to fear the Lord. We've got to finish here. So I can get to chapter 8. We're going to zoom. Get this, guys. Two minutes, and we're going to zoom through the rest of chapters uh, uh, 6 and all of 7. Ready? (laughs) Count me. We'll see. Oh, I don't know if I can do it. Ha, ha. I'm not going to read through it all because it's really a list of kind of genealogy. It's a, it's, a, it's a rundown of all the people that end up coming back. Because you'll see that in the beginning of chapter 7, Nehemiah has a big, he just, they built the wall, they built this place up, it's looking great. But there's not very many people in Jerusalem. And all these people that were supposed to come out of the Babylonian captivity, he was wondering, where are they at? Where are the people at? We built the house, things are in order, where are they at? So he calls for the, the priests to get together the scroll that came from Ezra chapter 2. Is when Ezra, actually underneath the, 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 the coming of Zerubbabel and, 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 and uh, Joshua, the, the, the exile that was starting to come back and take place. And they wanted to get a log, kind of a count of who and what and where and where the people at. And, and they wanted to get that figured out. And that's what you read in chapter 7. The strange thing about chapter 7 that you and I, actually, let's read the end of chapter 6 into chapter 7, because this gets really strange, really strange real quick, 15 through 19. We won't read through 7. So, uh, so it was when the wall was finished on the 25th day of Yule, in 52 days, verse 16, and it happened that when our enemies heard of it, the nations around us saw that these uh, saw uh, saw these things that they were uh, er, um, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. The Lord saw them through it, and also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. And the letters to, to, of Tobiah came to them, for many in Judah were pledged to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, who was the high priest. Interesting. The son of Uriah, the son of Jeho, uh, Jehoniah, and married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berkiah. Also, they reported his good deeds before me, and they reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. Did you catch that? The high priest, the, 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 the people that, that, that were supposed to be looked up to, the religious folks in, in Jerusalem were, were the whole time, 52 days, corresponding with Tobiah. This guy's good. His name means what? God is good, right? Remember we talked about that? Tobiah's name means God is good. Isn't that weird? He was actually a pagan that took a Jewish name because he married the daughter of the high priest. He snuck in, wanted to be part of the people. And so they're, they're saying, so, so they're, Nehemiah, come on, he's a good guy. He, I know he, he's, he's got faults here and he's kind of a little bit strange, you know, how he acts with you, but he's a good guy, isn't he? Well, get this, we, we move into chapter seven and we see what good guys can do. Again, chapter 7 was supposed to be the retelling of the the story of the people coming into Jerusalem from Ezra chapter 2, but you'll notice something. There's a disparity between the accounts in Ezra chapter 2 and Nehemiah chapter 7. There's some names that are added that weren't in the Ezra account. There are names that were not there in Nehemiah chapter 7 that were there in in Ezra chapter 2. And some people say, well, look, the Bible's full of contradictions, and there's one of them. You have the original scroll that it back, it was written back in Ezra chapter 2. They had all the names written down. And then you, you're stating here in chapter 7 of Nehemiah this same group of people, and it's missing some. Bible can't be trusted. Actually, that's not the story. The sad thing is, 
is that there were people that started the race and didn't finish. And interestingly enough, there were some that weren't on the toll to begin with, planning to go back to the land, and they said, you know what? There'd be no better thing to do with my life. Hop on board. Follow the Spirit. And and I say that to end here because I don't want us to be religiously self-deceived, but to be spiritually secure. We see Tobiah here who's trusting in his good deeds, his good works. We see a whole religious system there in Jerusalem that's saying, yeah, man, he's a good guy. And so it's just about being a good guy, isn't it? No, it's not. Because good men that had great intentions at the beginning of chapter 2 of Ezra, planning to go into this promised land again that they got taken back out of, and they had hopes and dreams of fulfilling all the dreams and visions and goals that Jesus and, or the Father had for them to go back into the land, and many of them did not go with them. In 1 John 2, it says it this way, they, were out, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Jim, what are you saying? Are you saying you can lose your salvation? Are you saying that you you can sign up and and then not show up? No, but it's very interesting that I think you and I don't know the heart And there's a lot of people that will come and they'll have great intentions and they'll be good looking and things will be, you know, kind of banging on all cylinders. And they might talk with the the, the religious people. They might kind of play around and dabble in, but they're not all in. And they don't end up there. Galatians 3 reminds us this, so foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has deceived you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Uh, this, I only, or this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are now being made perfect by the flesh? You, you know, I, I want you to know this today, that it's easy for us to be deceived along the way. Whether it's a matter of losing your salvation or not, I don't think so as much as it's saying where your heart was originally at. But I I would challenge you today to not be self-deceived in that maybe you are sitting here today and have built on a foundation not on Christ but on good works. You, you began the race along with everyone else, trusting seemingly in Christ, but believing deep in your heart that really, uh, I'm just going to clean up my act and I'm going to follow along and I think I'll be okay and, and I'll, they'll let me in heaven. I'll be all right. No, no. You might even have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, but now are being bewitched or deceived, like Paul is saying to the Galatian brethren. Why are you trusting in your good works? That doesn't save you. It's only the work of Christ that saves you. Don't be deceived. And all I would challenge you today, and I've got a lot more to say, but we're out of time. I, I would check out some of those verses, and I want you to ask yourself this question. Who am I following and Why? Tobiah was this good man, seemingly, but that wasn't good enough because our good is just as good as hell. Jesus said our rights, or Paul said our righteousness is just filthy rags. You know and I know. So are you putting your trust this Christmas season in your goodness because, you know, at the end of the year, my giving gets up a little bit and I hand out a few more canned goods and really I look, I feel like a good person, you know, and the Lord's going to love me that way. He doesn't love you because of what you do. He loves you because he died for you. Because you were helpless by yourself. I'd pray that you and I would be people that would finish the race strong and that would be people that signed up at the beginning and be there at the end. That our hearts would not deceive us in the in-between. That we followed something that really wasn't true to us. Because as it says in First, uh, first John there too, it's the, it was obvious they weren't of us. Because if they would have been with us, they would have stayed with us. They would have continued with, but it's obvious they weren't. 
They weren't of us. And I challenge you, man, today more than ever, for Second Peter uh, 1, 10 says, says to, to check your calling and election and make sure that it's certain. Know for certain every day, even this Christmas season you celebrate, don't let it just be another Christmas. Don't let your situation, your Sundays in the days here, don't let it just be business as usual. Make sure that you're calling an election. Make sure you're on the list and make sure that you're gonna finish strong. That's the heart of chapter seven of Nehemiah. So who am I following? Are you following you? Don't follow Christ. That's why he came as a babe in Bethlehem to die for your sins and, and, and to come and, and, and it's take on all of the iniquity and sin and the junk that you face that, that as you and I turn from that and look to him, it's not our works, but it's our faith in him that saves us. That's the only way. Are you following people that are leading you down deceptive roads and paths that really aren't full of truth and they they belittle you and it puts you in a place that just doesn't feel right and seem right because the Spirit gives life, but I'm profiting nothing right now? I would challenge you to follow truth, follow Jesus. Don't do it because of money, don't do it because of it. Do it. Don't do it because you, you had to look like a good person because you're part of the, the house. Or don't do it because you wanted to, you know, kind of own up. Do it because you need a heart change and I need a heart change. I'd pray that you and I and everybody here this Christmas season would be sure that we have accepted the best and most important gift that any of us will ever be able to unravel for eternity. And that's this Jesus that came for you to die for you and me. That's, that's the best gift. And I pray that you get it not just because you want eternity and not just because you want to feel good or be part of a, a cool crew or whatever. I pray that you'd want that because you want a relationship with the very God that made you. So I pray that you're on the list. I pray that you stick with it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Lord, I know I've gone over and we thank you for the grace that comes with that, Lord, because time is in your hands and not our own. And Lord, I think it would be important that we would say here that every person would have the opportunity to know for certain that they're quote unquote on the list, that they know for certain their calling and election is sure, to know for certain that their heart is in a place that has accepted you and not themselves and the good works that they've done. So Lord, I pray this Christmas season that, that people here would not see that they have to necessarily return to an altar or, or, or say the, the perfect prayer, but Lord, that they would simply consider their heart right now. And Lord, if it's been trusting in anything else other than the work of your son, if it's been trusting in good works or if it's been trusting in, in, in trying to just be associated or, or feeling good, Lord, I pray that they would renounce those ways of foolish men and ignorant men today and they would accept you, Jesus, for being the replacement for their sin and the only good that can come. And Lord, that the power of your spirit would seal them in this race that we're in. Lord, I pray that there would be not a single person here that would not take that seriously and be deceived in their heart and someday fall away. Lord, we don't want to see anybody run away from the church or run away from your plan. And Lord, we know that their hearts, our hearts, can be rooted in something that's not foundational, which is you. We can feel like and think like and act like, but Lord, not really be. So Lord, I pray that everybody here really is in love with you. That as we come to your table this Christmas season, we'd kneel before you like the wise men. We'd kneel before you and praise and worship you like the, wise, uh, like the shepherds. That we'd really see that we need a relationship with the babe of Bethlehem. That our lives are not just partly his, but all his. That the best Christmas gift that could be given was a replacement, a brand new life that would be headed towards eternity and spent with our creator God. So, Lord, I pray today that people would make sure this Christmas 
that the story is real in their life. Lord, by simply putting their trust in you, not a perfect prayer, not a spiritual birth certificate, none of that, just that they would today put their trust in you. And Lord, you know their heart, and you know our heart. Help us to do business with you. And Lord, help us not to be deceived when people are coming against us in strange ways in this world that we live in, Lord. But let us know for certain, not only that we're saved, but that you're with us and you're guiding us and directing us in such a way that you're in control. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 We pray, 